All right, guys. <clears throat> so yesterday we talked about England's expansion here to the New World. All right. So we were talking about a few of these settlements here. And uh, I just want to kind of review what we mentioned yesterday, build off of that today, continue to talk about some of these charter companies, mention about the Colombian exchange that stems from this and you name it. All right. Anyway, so I want to talk about England. I want to mention more about their settlements here in the New World. All right. Like I mentioned, next year, you uh, have Mr. Henninger, you will pretty much start right from this morning. Right. So this age of exploration. So it's important to note. All right, make sure you hold on your notes here. This next year, we'll hit the ground running right from this point, from this period of time. So, that being said, if you have some time, okay, work on the bell ringer here. Think about some of the settlements here that England had. Uh, I know we talked yesterday too about another explorer that we mentioned about a war between two countries in Europe. That's going to set the stage here for England taking over the high seas. All right, so think about that too. All right, so there you go. I'll give you guys some time. Hmm. All right, you want to go down, Mr. Ruffs? So you can figure it out. Go ahead. Girls, you okay? What's the funny joke here now? Huh? Uh, too many Red Bulls, huh? Yeah. All right, get to work here. I'll get, let's get to it.
<clears throat> All right, okay, so <clears throat> let's first start here with uh, this famed explorer from England. They called him the dragon. What? The Spanish called him the dragon anyway. So who is this famed explorer that first circumnavigated the globe for England? The first Englishman to do this. Yeah. Sir Francis Drake. Yeah, Sir Francis Drake. Good job. Anyway, so he was an accomplished explorer. Obviously, sailing around the world. He pretty much took the same route as who? Who was the first person to do that, even though he didn't make it? His crew members did. Jason, go ahead. Magellan. Yeah, good job. Anyway, he followed Magellan's route pretty much the whole way, but as he gets over the Pacific Ocean, he travels further north, right? He stays along the continental lines of South America, up into parts of North America, to modern day Oregon, Washington State, and then he makes his way across the Pacific Ocean. But anyway, he was successful because he was the first Englishman to circumnavigate the globe. And yeah, he made it back, unlike Magellan, right? So that's something important. What else did he do? What else did he do? Why else was this guy so, so important here? Cade. He was a war hero. He was a war hero. He had a good job. So he helped defeat who? Spanish. Yeah, the Spanish. Good job. So at the end of the topic, and I know I'm kind of saving it here, but at the end of the topic, we'll focus more here on this war between Spain and England. And this is going to be for dominance of the New World and control of the seas. So for Sir Francis Drake going up, going up against the Spanish Armada, it looked like, man, the odds were against them. But he comes up with some unconventional methods, like literally lighting smaller boats on fire and ramming them into the larger Spanish fleet uh, while they're docked up in northern France. What? Crazy, I know. But uh, he comes up with these unconventional methods of warfare, and which allows, obviously, and propels England to win this war. So in any case, he he get he gets knighted, right? So what was kind of interesting here about this story of him getting knighted? Luna, go ahead. You know, yeah, right. So she obviously showed a lot of respect for Sir Francis Drake here. Went to his ship on top of his ship here and knighted him, which just goes to show about how you know uh, how how well known he was, how popular and successful of an admiral and captain, right? Uh, also, with the English, right? What were they doing to a lot of these Spanish ships as they're making their way across the Atlantic Ocean? This is something to note, and it kind of gets to a point where there's a lot of stories about them, right? Uh, a lot of a lot of, a lot of fascinating stories about these types of people. Go ahead, Jason. Too much pirate. Yeah, good job, right? So when it comes to the pirates of this time period, well, this is kind of where it all leads to. So the English were successful pirates. I know it sounds crazy, but as uh, Spain was bringing back a lot of riches, a lot of gold, a lot of resources from the new land, England was trying to catch up, right? So they were doing a lot of pirating for these Spanish ships, right? Taking their loot, taking their gold, taking their resources. And actually, a lot of these settlements here in a new world actually started off as just kind of basis for the English to uh, set up this pirating <coughs> scheme, pretty much, right? Anyway, so what colony settlement here did we talk about? It was a lost colony, a lost settlement. Uh, this is one that we mentioned yesterday towards the end of class. Elena, go ahead. Roanoke, yep, good job. What do we know about Roanoke? Well, yeah, what do we know? What's that? It disappeared, yes, good job. Who was the person that found it, Roanoke? From the outer skirts here in Virginia. If you remember this, in your notes, so I'm sure you Blake. Sarah Walter Raleigh. Yes, yeah, Sir Walter Raleigh. Good job. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you. We'll see. We'll see later. Hopefully, we'll remember who lose track of time. Anyway, yeah, Sir Walter Raleigh. He discovers this well, new settlement here, uh, right off the coast here of Virginia. All right. When we talk about colonies, which we'll mention a little bit, I'm not going to go too much in detail, but uh, with Virginia especially, who's it named that? Virginia. Oh, Luna. Yeah, good job, right? So I know I talked about a Tudor sailor yesterday with Sir Francis Drake. Here with Sir Walter Raleigh, same thing. Right? They're from this Tudor dynasty of England. Right? I know I focused a lot on the Tudor dynasty last topic of Henry the Eighth. Uh, obviously, Elizabeth the First being one of these monarchs here that's pushing for this age of exploration. All right, anyway, Sir Walter Raleigh discovers Verona, sure. All right, as this people kind of get off the boat here trying to establish a settlement, he goes back and tries to bring back more resources, more people, right? 
And uh, what does he bring back with them that really gets the crown England all excited, especially with their marketplace? You're like, hey, it's not gold, it's not silver, it's not this Northwest Passage either. But what is it? What is this source here? Oh, wait, go ahead. Tobacco. Yeah, good job. So it's tobacco. This is going to start off this trade amongst England, right? The New World. This is going to really put them investing in a lot of money, a lot of resources here to establish settlements, colonies to extract this resource of tobacco. So yeah, that was a big part, a big, big part. Anyway, as Sir Walter Raleigh comes back, this is where the uh, mysterious um, story comes from. It's like, oh, where did where did the settlers go? No, no. What did they find? What did they find, Jason? Yeah, good job, right? Crow going carved in a tree. And uh, that was it. It's like, where did the settlers go? No one really knows, right? But there's probably proof over time. Either the Native Americans wiped them out, killed them, right? Or they actually interwove themselves within the Native tribes, which there were some reports here about some of these Native children having blonde hair and blue eyes or what? This doesn't make sense. But obviously, you got to imagine these people went somewhere. Or they're forced in slaves on the Natives. Maybe that happened too. Who knows? <clears throat> All right. Anyway, then this leads to another settlement. The first successful one. What was the first successful English settlement here in a new land? Batty, go ahead. Jamestown. Yep, good job. So 1607, Jamestown is found. So again, just like well, Roanoke here, they're trying to find this Northwest Passage. Right? A lot of the early discoveries here are happening right around modern day Virginia, right? That's where the Chesapeake Bay is. Okay. So as you're as these settlers, as these explorers are trying to search for this. Northwest Passage, they come across this Chesapeake Bay region. They think it goes internal a lot further, connecting over the Pacific Ocean. We all know that doesn't happen, but that's where a lot of these settlements take place. All right, with Jamestown, where did they settle? This wasn't a great place to have a settlement, huh? The land was not great. What kind of land was it? Malibu. What's that? I can't hear you. The New World. The New World? Yeah, okay. But what about the land, the surface itself? Was it rocky? Was it mountainous? What was it? Was it, what was it here? Go ahead, Elena. It was like a swamp land, right? So when you think about buildings in here, when you think about people trying to survive in this type of environment, it's difficult. And that's why a lot of these English settlements uh, first weren't successful, especially Jamestown. Even though it was successful, well, a lot of these people suffered. Right? They needed the natives to help them when it comes to survival, when it comes to food, when it comes to materials, growing crops, right? It was difficult. So that's something to think about with Jamestown in itself. They it settled on a swamp. What the heck? All right. Uh, well, the story goes out with John Smith, Pocahontas, sure, right? And Disney takes that story and twists it a bit, makes it a romantic love story, which that's really not what happened. But in any case, she did save John Smith from getting killed by Right, her tribe, all well, African tribe. But in any case, uh, with Jamestown, uh, this really solidifies what? As being this cash crop. What was it again, Jason? Tobacco. Tobacco. Good. So with England, they're going to invest a lot of money to try to colonize a new land here. A lot of it based just off tobacco. Wild enough. All right. Is there any questions here on that, guys? Roanoke, Jamestown. All right. We're going to talk about other settlements here. More religious means. As we move on. All right. So again, the explorer's chart. I like you guys to add on to this. I know I don't have, well, when Ms. O'Neill and I were creating this, we just put some of these basic explorers down, but I added to it as we're going through it. So I think it's important. I think it's very important that we keep track of these explorers, these settlements, and the reasons why these settlements started. Again, next year, when it comes to American history, right, you guys will start right at this point, right at this time. All right. So let's get to it. <clears throat> All right, so we just finished up with Jamestown. I right, talked about tobacco trade and how this is a big, important part. But as you can see, all the diets, he does come to a close right around here when Jamestown is founded, right, as the settlement takes off. So this is now starting the Stuart Dynasty. All right, so we'll mention more about the Stuart Dynasty a little bit more down the line here. But in any case, well, Elizabeth I, no longer is living. All right, so Rona, Jamestown. All right, so what about religious means, though? Okay, so I'm sure you guys heard of the pilgrims before. I'm sure you heard of the Puritans. Yeah, I'm sure you have. But with England, as they're transitioning into a lot of these different religious beliefs, and uh, as many of these 
religious ideologies take off here in, in England. Well, this forces a lot of people that, well, aren't represented anymore, or don't have the freedom of religion that they wanted or desired, to try to seek new land. So the pilgrims especially, in this Puritan form of belief and religion, well, as they're getting really killed over in England because their religious beliefs and practices, they thought, we got to find somewhere new. we got to try to establish a new place, a new settlement, where we can express our religion freely. Oh, freedom of religion in America, where does this come from? Well, a lot of the foundation, yeah, from the settlement here, the pilgrims and the Puritans. All right, anyway, so as the pilgrims come across on the what? What was their ship? What was their ship here? Oh, here we go. All right, Austin. Mayflower. The Mayflower. Yeah, good job. Good, the Mayflower in 1620. They make their way across the Atlantic Ocean. Was it easy? No, not at all, right? There's a lot of depth here making their way across the Atlantic, right? So at these voyages, it wasn't like it was just such an easy thing to do, right? You're low on food, low on resources. You got to imagine there's a lot of coastal storms as well. And out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, pretty scary, let's face it. All right, but anyway, with the pilgrims, they do establish their settlement here. Plymouth, right? Plymouth Rock. I'm sure you guys heard of that before as well. Uh, in Massachusetts area. So close to Boston, close to Salem, right? That's where we're looking at for this settlement. Anyway, with the Mayflower, well, and the people here on the Mayflower, the pilgrims, they established the first means of democracy that's going to embrace the new world, right? This is known as the Mayflower Compact, right? So with the Mayflower Compact, this was an agreement amongst the pilgrims on the Mayflower that they're going to establish this settlement where people have a voice, people have a say in what happens in this new settlement. So when you think about the foundations of the U.S. government with democracy and, again, people having a say in what happens here when it comes to the government practices, well, Mayflower Compact was this first, really, uh, an embracement of democracy in the new world. So that's something to think about, about our government, right? And uh, what we looked at as inspiration to apply to our own. So that's something to think about. All right. So yeah, obviously with Athens way back in the day during ancient times, sure they had democracy, but in a new land, a new world, this is the first one. Right. So the Mayflower Compact. Make sure you guys note that right that down somewhere. <clears throat> All right. So eventually the pilgrims, right? Well, you guys know the story here on Thanksgiving, sure. Right. As uh, they're trying to establish a settlement, it was difficult. Right. It was difficult. They didn't know how to hunt the land, harvest the land, but there's a lot of native groups there that were there to help them out, right? So this first encounter was friendly, and then it gets out. I get it, right? We all know this, right? But when it comes down to the natives did help the pilgrims when it comes to establishing this settlement. What type of foods they had? Yeah, sure, they had turkey, awesome, but it was more actually based off of um, based off of fishing, or more based off of different types of uh, fish and uh, even uh, shellfish. Like the first Thanksgiving, so it's not typically what you think of as a Thanksgiving meal. And so, yeah, they did have corn, sure, they did have turkey, but a lot of it was revolved around fish. And a lot of it was revolved around what they would find there along Massachusetts Bay. So that's important to know. All right, the Puritans. Okay, so the Puritans, John Winthrop, maybe you heard of him before too. Uh, he does establish this Massachusetts Bay colony. Right. And what were they doing? Well, same thing like the pilgrims here. They're trying to establish a place where they can embrace their religion freely. So they settled right around Salem, right? Then Boston. Right. So I'm sure you heard of Boston before. The Red Sox. Oh, excuse me. All right. Anyway, with Boston, okay, with uh, the Puritans, they established this Massachusetts Bay Colony. And yeah, modern day Maine is still part of that colony at this point at that time. Right, so the pilgrims will actually combine with the Puritans and form this Massachusetts Bay Colony. And again, I'm sure you guys heard about these these groups here before. But I wanted to make sure you guys know that it wasn't just because of pirating the English were trying to establish this settlement, these eventually colonies. It wasn't just based off of gold or the Northwest Passage, but also religious freedom. So when it comes to the God, the glory, and the gold, yeah, God does definitely have a big part of these new settlements here in the new world. So England, especially, right? And a lot of it because they're facing a lot of turmoil, the Puritans especially, the pilgrims, they're facing a lot of turmoil back in England. They're looking for and embracing these new settlements in the new world. All right, so down the line here, you guys will talk. I'm not going to focus on it too much. 
But yeah, these settlements will eventually turn into 13 original colonies, which you guys probably know a little bit about already. Uh, next year, like I mentioned, you'll hit the ground running with this topic, with this chapter, with the age of exploration and these first settlements here in the New World. So when it comes to the 13 colonies, they try to break them up into different regions. So the New England colonies, right? The middle colonies, which Pennsylvania is a part of this middle colony, and then the southern colonies. So when it comes to resources and goods and valuables like cotton, I mean, tobacco, indigo, well, the cash crops, that's going to be focused more down here in the southern colonies, right? So they're going to be your money maker, especially Virginia, right? So when you guys talk about the foundations of government, the biggest population, the wealthiest people are from Virginia. And the reason for it is because of Chesapeake Bay. And that's where a lot of these settlements started, right? Again, the Northwest Passage, they thought they could get through here, but Obviously, that doesn't connect way out to the Pacific Ocean. So a lot of these settlements happen right around Virginia here, the Chesapeake Bay region. All right, uh, Pennsylvania. Who founded Pennsylvania? What was this guy's name? Naomi. William Penn. Yeah, good job. Pennsylvania means what? Anybody? Hey. Penn's Woods. Penn's Woods. Yeah, good job. So you guys know a little bit about this already. Again, I'm not going to dive in deep because you'll talk about this next year. we got to keep moving. But main thing here for Pennsylvania is that this is this holy experiment. Right, William Penn is going to establish this, this colony here for people to come and embrace their religion. Uh, when you talk about Rhode Island, they'll do the same thing, right? So Roger Williams, he'll embrace this religious colony here for anybody. Anybody that might be outcasted, especially from Massachusetts Bay Colony, because they're not as pure as what they should be, right? Uh, they'll embrace these heretics. What? Crazy. I know. Anyway, I just want to make sure you guys knew the distinctions of these regions of the 13 colonies. Right? Up here, obviously, it's going to be more fisheries. Right? They're going to be expanding into fishing, and uh, you know their marketplace is going to be a revolved around that. Right? As we're looking at here, the middle colonies with Pennsylvania, it's a lot of farming. Yeah, okay, tobacco, sure, but definitely down here in the southern colonies, it's going to be more with indigo, cotton, tobacco. So your money makers are definitely going to be down here in the southern colonies. All right, moving on. So colonization, like I just said, for England, as they defeat Spain in this war, and defeat the Spanish Armada, England is going to have control of the seas, right? They're not going to see second place when it comes to their naval power all the way up until the end of World War II. So there's a lot of time here, a big chunk of time, where England is just controlling everything. They have a monopoly, they have a control of the high seas, and they can do freely what they want. That's bad, I hope so. All right, so with this colonization, England's not just obviously controlling the 13 colonies here in the New World. They do have control of parts of Africa, parts of Asia, and, well, their, their, uh, their, their overseas territories are going to amass to a point where the sun never sets on the English Empire, right? So it never sets on the English Empire. So you'll hear about that a lot moving forward. But England definitely is taking control. Anyway, like I mentioned, it wouldn't happen without that war against Spain, which we'll mention more towards the end of the topic. But with colonization, well, obviously these countries aren't just going to try to lag behind. I know England's taking over for sure, but France is getting involved too. They come to the mix a little bit later, but they do establish a lot of firm trade with Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley and the Mississippi River region. So the fur trade with, uh, with uh, different types of pelts that they're bringing in, uh, and applying it to their marketplace. France is going to be a very prosperous country here, too, even though they get to it late. Uh, the Dutch, the Netherlands, we'll mention more about them, too. We kind of talked about them with uh, Henry Hudson and how they're trying to find this Northwest Passage. Uh, the Dutch is going to be more focused out in Asia, so the West Indies, or sorry, the East Indies, and moving up into parts of Japan, right? So they actually open up trade with Japan, and no other European country can do that. Right, because they want to bring Christianity there. The Dutch didn't want to do that. They just wanted to open up trade. So Japan was actually friendly with the Dutch, which is interesting. All right, so you'll see a term here, obviously capitalism. Right, when it comes to the coining of the term capitalism, we'll mention about that with Adam Smith here again towards the end of the topic. Right, how resources, materials are going to be vital for marketplaces to boom, to explode, and that's going to apply a lot of wealth to this country. Right, these countries like England, like Spain. Right, like France, right? They're going to actually uh, invest a lot of money here in these settlements, these colonies, extract the resources. We'll talk about extractive economies here soon, and they're going to be juggernauts, literally. <clears throat> All right, so charter companies, 
One thing to note too with capitalism is that you let the free market do its thing, right? Uh, as the governments are taking control of exploration, like they did with Spain, well, if they're diving in a lot with the funding of these naval ships and uh, the funding for these colonies, they're going to drain their pockets. Right? If the <laughs> government does that, well, you're not going to have much of a country uh, for the future. So it's important that these private companies actually try to take off with this exploration. right? And you have people that sponsor them or buy stocks within this joint stock company. So overall, you can support these adventures, this exploration, without the government even getting involved in it. And then the government, the country here, can actually focus on building up a stronger navy or military. And you can let these private companies do their thing, so to speak. All right, so with charter companies, England definitely will take that route with these joint stock companies. And uh, the tobacco trade, again, is going to kick that off. Uh, with current events, you guys can compare that with you got SpaceX, right? So SpaceX, what Elon Musk is doing with these adventures into space, it's pretty amazing. And it's a private company doing it. So the government doesn't have to spend these resources, this, uh, this ton of money here, billions and trillions of dollars for the space exploration. It's a private company doing it. The problem is, well, you got to make sure that private company is reined in a little bit, right? They're literally building rockets that can go up into space. So hopefully they're on our side. No one else was saying. But in any case, for the charter companies, that's a good way to relate it to what's happening today, right? With exploration in the space. Uh, Jeff Bezos has one too. Anybody know Jeff Bezos? Space exploration. What's it called? Blue Origins? So anyway, there's a lot of these billionaires diving into this new trend, I guess, of space exploration. All right, mercantilism. So with mercantilism, Right, this is a nation's power based off the wealth that they're extracting from uh, these colonists and trade with other countries. So when it comes to mercantilism, this is going to be a big part of England, Spain, France, right? uh, even Portugal, right? and uh, their power. So yeah, Portugal, they might have started off the age of exploration, but these trade routes around Africa, yeah, they're successful, they're great and all, but the resources, the glory, and I guess you say a lot of the gold and riches are in the new world. So Spain, France, and England are really dominating this trade. They're dominating this new wave here to the new world. So Portugal's kind of fallen behind, even though they started this all off. But with mercantilism, again, this is knowing a nation's power is based off their wealth. And again, what resources they're bringing in. So early on, yeah, Portugal started it, but Spain really was controlling the means of exploration, the means of colonization in the new world. We talked about that with these conquistadors, right? We mentioned about that with their conquerors, right? Uh, England, like I just mentioned, they'll defeat Spain in a war. So if they defeat the almighty power of Spain, they're going to take over, right? And that's where we see the establishments of these new settlements like Jamestown and eventually the 13 colonies. But again, the goal here, finding gold, silver, Northwest passions would be great. If you control trade routes, well, you can tax anybody trying to utilize that trade route. So eventually, yeah, we mentioned about this Northwest Passage. Eventually, the United States, later down the line, will actually create a canal that connects the Atlantic and Pacific. And it's known as the what canal? Balboa walked over this part of the land here. The land? The Pamela Canal. Yep, good job. So that's something interesting to note that, yeah, later down the line, even in the 1900s here, the United States realizes that we need a way to connect these two oceans. I know it takes about four, uh, 500 years to do that, but let's face it, they didn't have the industrialization to do it back in the day. All right, anyway, so with these colonies, provide a source of gold, silver, raw materials, and a market for manufactured goods. So we get to the 1800s, well, there's going to be a, another wave of exploration. And for these European countries especially, they're going to try to imperialize or take over for many of these territories that are just weaker than, that are rich with resources and materials. So like Africa. I actually have a game for you, which is pretty cool. If you guys ever played a game Risk, roll the dice, it's pretty cool. You just try to take over and conquer lands. And that's a part of this, the next chapter that we'll talk about with the age of imperialism. Should be fun, should be fun. But this is where it begins. This is where it really starts. All right, so here's a pretty good political cartoon. You guys know political cartoons? Yeah? Okay, so another piece is, it explains really what's happening. So mother country, you got to imagine, yeah, this is England, right? So England, especially establishing the 13 colonies, they're bringing in, right, with their colonies, a lot of resources and materials that are just going to enrich 
the crown. It's going to enrich the country to become, well, let's face it, kind of kind of obese here, that gluttony, right? And uh, you can imagine that they're bringing in a lot of these resources to a point where the mother country is just reaping all the benefits, right? These colonies, they're not really getting much of it. You can kind of see it with the sneers on her face, especially this one. She's like, oh, I'm disgusted, right? Obviously, because as England comes in, these other European countries, they're taking the resources and even forcing many of the indigenous people in these lands as slaves in their own land to extract the resources for the mother country for England, for Spain, for France, but England especially, right? So gold and silver, foodstuffs, raw materials, right? They're all supplying that for the crown, for the country itself, making it rich, making it prosperous. So this is a good political cartoon emphasizing mercantilism, right? Uh, mentioning about how these resources enrich the crown. All right, another thing here, Colombian exchange. So hopefully you guys have a term in your scores chart somewhere, your notes. Anyway, the Columbian Exchange named after who? Who's it named after? Columbus? Oh, go oh, ahead, oh, Jason. Yeah, Christopher Columbus. So as a lot of these countries are diving into this new trade, as these countries are diving into this colonization, yeah, they're bringing in a lot of resources and materials, well, from Europe, from Africa, right, to the new land. And in doing so, they're extracting the resources from the New World and bringing it back to Europe, to their marketplaces. So here are just some resources, and unfortunately, right, the negative aspects here of diseases, and you got it, yeah, slavery will fall as well. Right? But in any case, for Europe, they're enriching themselves on tomatoes, corn, right, vanilla, uh, coca, right, the coca beans or chocolate, sure, uh, peanuts, turkeys. Uh, turkeys especially. Turkeys was one of the biggest parts here that helped supply a lot of the marketplaces in Europe. They loved it. Pumpkins, squash, you name it, right? So a lot of these resources here, you can only find in the New World. So think about it. These Italians, they're making pizza without tomatoes? How did that happen? Right? Obviously, this is a resource that they're bringing from the New World. Something interesting there. Ben's Bites, there you go. Yeah, yeah, good, good. All right, anyway. So from Europe, Africa, Asia to the New World, yeah, they're going to bring resources as well. So bananas, grapes, those are big ones. Uh, peaches, we've got honeybees. What? Jeez. And then yeah, like I mentioned, with the European, uh, the Europeans <clears throat> making encounters here with the Native Americans, smallpox, measles. These are two diseases, obviously, contagions that spread pretty rampant through the Native populations. They wipe out over ninety percent of these native groups, which I talked quite a bit about already. So yeah, it wasn't like it was just all fun and games with resources and materials, but diseases did fall. And the Europeans, as they encountered the Native Americans and the weaker immune systems, it wipes a lot of them out, right? Another thing too, which we'll talk about, the slave trade, right? So with the slave trade, um, this is going to bring slavery to the new world. And it's gonna extract resources and materials like no other. And yeah, that's going to be a part of the foundation of our country that's going to lead eventually to a civil war. But in any case, the slave trade does take place at the same time here as this Columbian Exchange. Right here's just another name for this Columbian Exchange, right? Uh, I know they're kind of interchangeable, but the triangular trade, you can see how this works. Right, the biggest thing here to note is that these European countries, they go down to Africa and they bring guns, they bring weapons, they bring armor. And as they interact with these African warlords and kings, they say, hey, we'll give you weapons, we'll give you these new advanced muskets and armor in exchange for, well, slaves, right, for body, for people. And these African kings actually did that. So they go to rival nations, rival tribes, rival, um, you know, lands within Africa, take other Africans, right, and actually sell that here to the Europeans. So, yeah, when you think about the slave trade, it was brutal. It was terrible. And these African kings would actually go to rival tribes, rival nations, and pull and take, right, these um, these African slaves, these people from other tribes, and sell them to the Europeans. The Europeans then would bring this across the Atlantic Ocean to extract these resources, work as slaves in a new land, right? And from there, as you can see, these resources, like I just talked about, right, are making their way back to Europe. And enriching the crown, enriching many of these European countries, become strong, become very wealthy. And what wealth comes? Jason? Power. Power. Yeah. 
All right, I know I didn't get to the slave trade here today. I will talk more about that tomorrow, but many people kind of gave you a little bit of an idea of how this works with this triangle of trade. All right. Oh, happy birthday.